I just felt as though we needed to take a moment to pause and realize that we're 40 years into our ordination uh, of women in the Diocese of Texas uh, and the shoulders that we as a diocese stand on when we look back and we think about Betty Maskelet and Helen Havens as our kind of two first women ordained in this diocese and then to look out uh, and see the diversity of women serving in all kinds of ways in many different ministries, bringing all of their gifts to the, the work that God has called us to do, the mission, the ministry, the service, uh, the evangelism, and to take in and that kind of ability to see everybody together. It is an amazing thing that this diocese has done in the last 40 years and well worth celebrating. At that time in 1994, we only had a few women rectors. And if we think about that pure uh, number today, we move between 35 and 45% of all of our clergy being uh, women in the Diocese of Texas and which just shows the growth that we've seen and many more rectors. Uh, women now serve on all of our committees, our commissions, uh, have a profound leadership role. Both Bishop Harrison becoming a canon to the ordinary, the first woman canon to the ordinary in the Diocese of Texas, uh, but we also saw women moving in directorships all across the diocese in small and uh, medium-sized congregations. And so uh, that, that, that showed just an evolutionary change. I think since Bishop Harrison has uh, taken the lead on our Commission on Ministry uh, for us, we've also seen that grow. And so by uh, what we know is that by seeing women in leadership, that empowers women and encourages women uh, towards leadership in, in the church. Well, I grew up in the Disciples of Christ denomination, which has always ordained women, but I had never seen one and a woman came to preach in our congregation. I was about eight years old, and I love saying that that day I said, forget ballerina, this is for me. And so very, at a very young age, I had this idea that I was called into the ministry of proclamation, uh, the uh, proclamation of the gospel, telling people about Jesus. It took until I was in my 30s to finally deal with the call and to begin to explore ordination. I was very affirmed by everyone in the process. I remember when I was 18 years old, so this is 1966, I thought about, you know, what I'd really like to do is do what my father does, be a priest, be a minister. We didn't use the word priest quite then. Uh, we used minister. And, and I go, oh, but I can't do that because I'm a girl. Girls could not acolyte. They were not, and I didn't know it at the time, but they were not even accepted in general convention at that time. As I grew up, it was in my heart to serve in the church in some way that I really would not have been able to articulate. Um, and of course, in that era, the idea of ordaining women to the priesthood was just not on anybody's radar screen. And then a really transformative moment in that process happened when Dina Harrison came to be the rector of our congregation, St. James the Apostle in Conroe. Amazingly, in 1997, I had never heard communion celebrated in the voice of a woman. I had heard women preach before, but not those um, very powerful words of the communion service. I first felt a sense that I was called to serve God in and through the church when I was in about eighth grade. It was more like a gentle wind over the course of a long time than a voice from heaven speaking to me in one moment. And over the course of high school and into college, I was invited into leadership. I'm afraid that my call to ordination was not the dramatic conversion experience on the road to Damascus. It was something I experienced as young as 10 or 11 or 12 in the Episcopal Church, uh, feeling when I saw those elderly gentlemen reading the scripture, I thought, I want to do that. When I saw the elderly gentleman uh, preaching from the pulpit, I thought, I want to do that. 
And that was about a time I became acquainted with a deacon who served at our church in Irving, Texas. And I remember the, the day he preached a sermon about, and talked about what a deacon is, about the foot in the world and the foot in the church. And, not, and it's like, oh, that's just perfect for me because I was committed to my profession and I didn't want to let that go, but I also was drawn to being the ordained life. My experience uh, moving into ordained ministry that people were uh, sort of mystified. It was so hard to create a category for an ordained woman for many, many Episcopalians. When I was first called to All Saints, there was one uh, woman who was violently opposed to having a, a woman in ordained uh, ministry, and certainly not in her congregation. She was very upset with the call. She was very rude to me. She was very uh, standoffish. And the day I left, she came up to me and she said, I remember how angry I was when you came to the congregation, but I can't remember why. <laughs> When I went to Mobile, Alabama as an associate, I overheard some people in a restaurant saying, oh, that's how the nuns are dressing these days. No one knew what to make of my caller. One little girl in a grocery store said, I love your shirt. Can I get one of those? No one knew what to make of a woman priest in Mobile in 1993. But people aren't surprised so much. They expect to see women in leadership in the church, and that's a wonderful, wonderful change. Well, one uh, experience that kind of reflects the uh, newness of uh, ordained women at the time I was ordained and, and what changed, uh, one of my very first calls as a young assistant was uh, calling on an elderly gentleman, and in those days we did we knocked on doors and called on people without warning. And uh, I knocked on his door and greeted him and he opened the door and looked at me so sternly and basically told me to go away. <laughs> and it was, it was such a shocking experience of re rejection and, and, and shame um, that it was very profound and significant for me. And then a, a number of years later, I became the priest in charge of the little parish, another little parish that he was part of, and our relationship completely changed. And he became uh, one of my favorite people. We became fast friends. I was in the second wave of women who were ordained. And so at that time, um, the thing was just to get us in parishes. And so we were encouraged to take jobs for no pay. So that, yeah, so that we could be in, and serve in parishes so people could get to know us. And when we took communion, uh, the, the rail was divided. So if people did not want to receive from me because I was a woman, they would go to the other side of the rail. But my experience was that once people experienced us, well, yeah, it was fine. It was just they couldn't imagine what it was like. And so that's been my process is to go into a place People got to know me, and then they were fine. And it was really about relationship. It's a new day in terms of how our culture is being uh, socialized with the role of women. One of my favorite stories is uh, a woman in one of our congregations who told me during carpool, her son was talking to a, another little boy who said his bishop was coming to visit. And her son said, it's a he, and the boy said yes, and the, her son said, well, men can't be bishops, only ladies can be bishops, because I was the only bishop he had ever seen. And I had been twice to their congregation, and as far as he was concerned, that category was filled by a woman. One thing that I enjoy um, in my role at Trinity Galveston is the school and uh, an enrollment of 300 students. And so as they grow up in chapel, you don't have to talk about ordaining women in that community. They're growing up from childhood to young adulthood, and they might want to be a dentist, they might want to be a nurse, they might want to be a priest, they might want to be the captain of a ship, or they might want to work in hospitality. Um, but that being ordained a minister is just one of those things that's, of course, 
naturally on that long list because it's what they see and hear every day when they come to school. I was so fortunate and privileged to come to Trinity Galveston in January of 2012 as the priest in charge, essentially kind of on a trial run and with a six month period of time. There already was that sense of the great gifts of women in ministry, um, but maybe not necessarily as the 11th rector of our congregation. So if we fast forward then five years um, at our vestry retreat in 2017, we began the conversation about hiring an associate rector. And after discussing every bit of that process, I took a big deep breath and asked them, what if it turns out that the best candidate for associate rector of Trinity is another woman? And I'm so proud to say they didn't know why I asked. I actually, um, I'm the second one from um, in our diocese, but I am the first from an only Hispanic Latino uh, parish. So I'm very excited. I'm very happy for the diocese. I feel like we're doing a lot to just really encourage uh, women of color to go to seminary. So I really hope that this is an opportunity for others to really see and that, you know, it's we can do it. I would like to see more people of color. Um, I think we are doing some work in that direction and I'm hopeful that uh, eventually that our diocese and other dioceses will really look like the kingdom of God. They'll reflect people of different colors and nationalities because we all bring something different and special to the table to be shared. I've had many um, jobs and this is the hardest job but the most rewarding at the same time. And the best first step is always to name out loud that we think that that's what God is calling us to. And then to be ready for an exciting um, and challenging journey. My uh, message to w uh, women called to ordination uh, especially is to trust your own voice, uh, use your own voice. We still need to spend time together. We still need to uh, intentionally mentor each other and um, and work for um, some systemic um, advocacy for women's ministry and leadership. The deployment of women has been and continues to be an issue in the church even though people uh, now to a much larger degree accept the ministry of women when it comes to my congregation and calling my rector, it's very hard for people to do that and to uh, see women as appropriate candidates. When I was a senior in seminary, the last people to be placed in my class were the women. And I was the very last person to be placed because uh, the men had first call on the jobs. We weren't even interviewed until the men were placed. What I wanna to say to encourage women is to see whether you see, um, whoever you see at the altar, whether it be man, uh, woman, uh, whatever kind of diversity or lack of diversity perhaps that you see and experience, realize that God calls all kinds of people into ministry. And that actually the most important thing is if you are hearing a call, if you feel as though you are being invited to consider ordained ministry, to realize we take that very very seriously and that we want to join with you in discerning uh, the potential that you have uh, to give and bring your gifts uh, to the wider church. So no matter what you see and experience, no matter what other people tell you, if you really are experiencing that, uh, the Diocese of Texas as a church, our Commission on Ministry, our congregations are ready to support women in, in ministry and support you to discover what God might be inviting you uh, to do and how God might be inviting you to serve. On this day, when we pause and look back, the only reason for doing that is to look forward and to wonder and dream about the women who will lead us in the future.